Yo, man, what math piece do you play? <laughs> I thought it was a good question. Now if somebody asked me that, I'd kick him in the teeth. Kill baby Hitler on the way to the Bill Evans concert. That's my final answer. Hi, I'm pro saxophonist Jamie Anderson, and you're watching Get Your Sax Together. I've got a super special show for you this week. I've got all your favorite sax YouTubers, all the people who took part in the uh, caravan collaboration that we all did recently. I've put them in the hot seat, interviewed each of them separately, asked them all the same questions, and now you've got a wonderful opportunity to find out a bit more behind all those characters that you know and love on YouTube. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, your arrangement. I mean, it was a brilliant arrangement. Really, really great. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, it was refreshing to be playing something that was really challenging. You know, whenever I'm doing things like that, I really try and push myself to just blow through it a few times, get comfy, make a recording, and then let it go. So maybe that's the thing that's actually the hardest. Um, so the hardest thing for me was just thinking about, I'm, f I'm not just sending this out into the void. I'm actually playing in a saxophone section, so I have to play in tune with people who I haven't necessarily heard yet and I have to play stylistically correct. Probably the hardest thing was just finding time to do it. The hardest thing for me for sure was that I wasn't at home when I did it. Like me just talking and teaching and doing the, what I usually do, I know how to do that all day every day. Trying to line myself up with a big band with my mobile recording gear was by far the hardest. <laughs> Well, I liked the arrangement. I thought the arrangement was really good. So it was fun to play. Some people make arrangements so hard that nobody can play them. And then you either get a chart that like nobody wants to play or one that always sounds bad <laughs> whenever it gets played because <laughs> people can't play it right. The end result, I think, hearing it all together, you know. Look, I've done a bunch of these sort of projects before and it's really difficult to know. You know, it's, it's, you don't know how it's going to turn out at the end. Um, but when all the voices were together and everyone's different character was in there, yeah, it sounded great. So that was definitely the high point for me, hearing the finished product. It either worked really well or you actually just re-recorded everybody's part and didn't tell us, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't touch anyone's parts. Honestly, just playing over the track, even after I recorded, I went back and I just like did the whole thing again just for fun. But to be able to play through a really well thought out, long arrangement that works really well, especially for saxophones. It was just fun. The written parts were harder. So I, I messed up the, uh, the written parts one or two times. And then once I got up to the solo, I played from there out and it was cool, so. You know, if we were doing it live, that would be a whole different thing, wouldn't it? That'd be awesome. Go into every performance knowing you're gonna make a mistake. In a, in a tune like that, we try to get it perfect for the recording, right? Because we can, we have the ability. But if you play something like that live, like with all those crazy lines, you're gonna mess up at some point, but don't let one mistake turn into 10 mistakes. I, the arrangement was great. It was a lot of fun to play. Uh, the two sax solis, which were really different, the one with the breakdown and the one with more of the bebop lines, super fun, super imaginative. I'm sure between the five of us, we all have like such cool different styles that it's just gonna sound great and really be a lot of fun to play together. <laughs> My, my video on the blues scale. I, I bought Lederhosen, a hat, and I created an alternate character that plays nothing but the blues scale. Because you know that guy, Jamie, at the jam session? That he's really confident, and you don't know why? And that confidence is that, that blues scale. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like a security blanket that he's got. And so I wanted to personify that guy in a character called Heinrich von Bluskalsen. And so my, I'll never forget my wife opening up a package that came to the door and she's pulling out lederhosen and a hat and a mustache. And I was like, it's for work. <laughs> so that's, so that, I that's one of that. like, you know, you know, I get plenty of comments that are like, you're not funny, you know, just, just shut up and play. And like, I'm thinking like, I'm having fun. I make myself giggle and then I don't care if anyone else watches it. I hope people learn, but like, I'm, I'm having the time of, the time of my life. I know. <laughs> Making well, I myself think... chuckle. I think you're funny. Well, just, uh, my so. wife would disagree, but thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Coming from a guy whose wife literally does save lives, we really do have to remember that we're not saving lives at all. We're not, but we add so much to life. What you and I, I mean, I kind of, I'm gonna get sincere and I'm sorry about that, but right. what we do, I feel so passionate, more passionate than in teaching in the university, because we're helping people 
that, you know, at the end of their work day or in, during retirement, they're like, what do I do now? My kids are out of the house. Where do they find that joy and that passion in life? And I joke, my wife is a, is a very prominent, successful physician in my area, our area. And I help joke that she helps keep people alive. She's basically a necromancer with a paycheck. Um, but we give them a reason to live. Sometimes I go back and I watch the old ones. I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. It's good. <laughs> I did a good job with that one. Sometimes I watch the old ones. Like the really old one, I'm like, oh, what was I doing? It's terrible. <laughs> so I like, like the recent one I did where I was in Elkhart and Fort Wayne, Indiana, where we were in, um, inspecting the saxophones. That one, I thought I did a really nice job and I thought it was super interesting. Um, the one I did at the Rigotti Reed um, factory, even though that's been a few years now, I think that came out really well. See, I was wondering if you were going to say you're kind of go for your breakthrough video because it opened up so much for you, you know, in the uh, Amazon review video. Yeah, I don't think uh, that's that good of a video. <laughs> I don't know why so many people watch it. I don't know why. That's an algorithm thing, I think. I don't know. I don't think it's that good of a video. I really, I did it super fast too. I mean, that but, was not a big effort in that video. Probably the first one that I specifically made, or at least first one I remember making for YouTube when I thought like, oh, I should make a video and put it here because people will watch it. And it was my, my Grammy band audition video. And for, the, for those who don't know what I'm talking about, it, it wasn't an actual Grammy band audition video. It was a joke video. I was, you know, in my late 20s, I think at the time. So I wasn't in high school, but a lot of my high school students had auditioned for Grammy band. And it was funny because a lot of these kids are great players, phenomenal players, 16, 17 years old, but it looks like they'd never been in front of a camera before. So they're, they're wearing, you know, it looks like their suit, jacket, you know, they just got for the first time or it's still wrinkled, it still has the creases on it from the thing. And it's just hilarious, like the way they, they don't know how to talk to a camera, which they shouldn't, they're 16 years old. But I thought it'd be hilarious to just do a complete parody video. So I did this video on Baker Street years ago and it was before I really knew anything about making videos and I looked really young and I've got no idea what I'm doing, like a script or anything like that. But I quite like that video because it's very honest and all I did literally one day is thought, you know what, a lot of people have been asking me about Baker Street, why don't I have a go at making a video? So I turned the camera on and I just sort of explained the song. And it, it turned out a lot, a lot of people like to watch that video, which is great. But I like to look at it because it reminds me of what the journey has been for me about learning about making videos and, you know, the, the whole process really. Uh, sit from that point to here. The one that kind of really blew up the most that's had the most views is how to improvise over chords. Because it can transform the way people are thinking about chords and improvisation super quick. I've been doing videos for about four years, five years, and the quality has definitely changed over <laughs> those, those four years. So when I go back to those videos before when I was just trying to figure it out and didn't have the gear or the knowledge and I spoke too loud, too fast and I did all of this stuff. Those are a little hard for me to watch. All right, so what was your favorite video that you've done? I reckon it was my Altissimo one. Okay, yeah, Because yeah. I, was, I was really happy with the the depth I went into it, you know, too. So imagine if you had YouTube when you were, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14, you've got all these favorite solos and somebody's just telling you exactly how to do it. I'd be so thrilled, you know, that would have made yeah. my day. I used to buy, you know, DVD, and not even DVDs, it was like VHS, man. VHS videos. <laughs> You're dating yourself. <laughs> I got this VHS video, I can't even remember the name of the dude now. It's like, how to play rock and roll saxophone. It's like really rubbish looking back, but I was lapping it up. I was like, all oh, right, that's how you growl, you know, all this sort of stuff. <laughs> Preparing enough, practicing enough, that I was playing the John Williams uh, Concerto, Escapades, with orchestra. And my wife and all her me medical colleagues were in the audience, and I was so relaxed, because I quit taking myself so seriously at that point. And I remember playing the second movement. I was so relaxed, I was playing this pianissimo section, and all I could think was, I hope they're enjoying this. And it took me a long time in my career to not be thinking, I hope the other saxophonists think I'm good. When I was young, I had this private teacher who would invite me to play on gigs that he was doing. So one day he said, oh, come down, you know, bring your saxophone. And I was like, terrified to play because, you know, he was all those great players and I was terrified. I showed up with the saxophone and it was his blues band, his great blues band. 
and and they were just playing like these lines and you know my, t- my teacher said come up and it was so grooving it's just i mean yeah, it was just that moment was um you know very infectious for me because i had never experienced music as a student you're never going to experience moments like that that only you know people that have been playing their whole lives can recreate on a regular basis right so that was the first time i kind of experienced that and i was like and I was very fortunate in Australia to get to play with this fabulous professional orchestra. And, uh, and we did some great things. So there's a, something about the feeling of being in the middle of a massive professional orchestra, uh, just the tuning in there. Oh, the whole energy is incredible. So doing that for some like national broadcasts and in some big theatres and stuff, that was cool. But I think for me, I think about lots of different types of gigs I did in different styles of playing. So, Conducting a show, you know, I conducted a show that went through Europe and that, that was awesome because it was a different challenge every day. And being out the front, leading the band instead of being in the band. But equally, I remember playing in the orchestra or, or doing jazz gigs. Um, so I can remember jamming in a little bar in, uh, in Skagway in Alaska with a house band and just guys, that, you know, in another country, but we've all got this common language uh, and just meeting new people, making great music. So, yeah, it's a tricky question, that one. I'd like to hear what your answer to that is, Jamie. I'd say one of mine is similar to yours, actually. When I played the uh, Frankie Valley tour, we played at the Albert Hall with the London Symphony Orchestra. And that was mind-blowing. The venue, the occasion, the orchestra. So when we went into uh, Greece is the Word and the whole orchestra going... I was mind blown I think playing with um, Incognito at the Blue Note in Tokyo is mind blowing as well wow Um, they're such incredible music fans and the whole experience of how organised the club was and how great the sound was and how everybody's trying to just bend over backwards to please you and you're playing solos and people are cheering you know in the middle of the solo and stuff is unbelievable playing with Shaka Khan at um the Love Box Festival, that was incredible as well. Because, you know, we've done so many functions, right, where you're you're playing these songs. <laughs> and then I had to pinch myself. I was like, ah, I'm actually playing it with Shaka Khan and it's orders of magnitude better. <laughs> so that was incredible. It's not a specific moment, but it's a it's a section of time. It was a month in between my junior and senior year of high school. So I was 16 going on 17 years old. And they had this thing called the Governor's School of the Arts. Basically what it was was high school kids got to like audition. And if you got in, you got to stay at this college basically between your junior and senior year for a month and live in a dorm and basically live a college music student life for about a month. And I got into that, funny enough, on classical saxophone. It didn't make the jazz one, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is that's a whole nother thing. Like before that, I was just like that one kid at my school or one of like three kids who were like liked music but it was you know everybody else was like I'm in band whatever but here it was like oh I'm around everybody else who thinks the same way I do in the, in the sense they're serious about music it was the first time I'd ever gone somewhere and they were like yo man what mouthpiece do you play <laughs> they started back then I was like oh god and like back then I thought it was a good question now if somebody asked me that I kick him in the teeth so <laughs> just kidding everybody disclaimer and it's kind of like to me yeah. what I'm hearing is it's you know going from the you know, a big fish in a small pond up to the next pond and being, yeah. you know, a smaller fish but with much cooler fish. Yeah, and I I went on this jazz course when I was young as well, which transformed my life. And They were really cool teachers there and I came back and I was like, I want to be a jazz musician. My mum and dad were yeah. like, no. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, because they're smart. They have a brain. <laughs> they're like, don't do it. <laughs> You know the story about the uh, jazz musician who won the national lottery and then he was interviewed and he won like 50 million dollars and they said so uh what are you going to do with all the money then he said well i'm just going to keep gigging until it runs out (laughs) (laughs) playing the first show with arrows was a really big one because i hadn't played on stage in front of 15,000 people like that but one of my like favorite moments that I remember is I was like in ninth grade taking a solo on Stray Cat Strut. And <laughs> that's the first time like I really hit a solo and felt great. I was like, oh, like it was like internal. Yeah. Like it was this thing that was coming out of me. And it's like, 
Yeah, I remember that moment like it was yesterday, even though it was a long time ago. There's a lot of those. <laughs> um, there's, you know, you're you're kind of taught that anything that is not, um, you know, like high level, high class music is uh, soul destroying. <laughs> So part of like the feeling like something is soul destroying camp comes from that. Because if you were if you were doing any other job, you wouldn't have that. You would this this right. not the psychology. You're doing a gig where it's uh you know, people are gonna hear you and see you and pay you money. And those are often the ones that musicians are like, oh, you know, I don't want anybody to know I'm doing that. <laughs> you know, it's just stupid. It's just stupid. So I mean, I had many of those moments, but it's almost like I wish I didn't think of it that way. There is soul destroying moments, you know, legitimate ones where, you know, where there's humiliating things, but it's not because really of the, the musical context. It's more about being poorly treated by people who are hiring you or, you know, things like that. This was a while ago when I was like 21 or 22 years old. I went to Smalls uh, in New York City, the jam session, and I kind of had the courage and didn't know that I didn't know any better to go up and do the jam session. And they called a couple songs and I didn't know them. And then the drummer was like, well, what do you know? <laughs> so that was that was one of the soul crushing moments. Oh, God, School of Hard Knocks, that one. I know, right? I had a, a, a showcase for a corporate band I was in. And the showcase is lights on stage, big lights, sound, smoke screen, the whole thing, blah, blah, blah. We're playing for all these people, prospective clients, to give out lots of money to book the band. And they were like, we're gonna feature a saxophone player on Careless Whisper. So somewhere between the dance set and this ballad thing, the top F key, the solder broke off and it, the top F key hung open. And if any of you don't play saxophone, or if you know this, that's the first key on the saxophone. So if that key's open, nothing will play. I didn't know this, spotlight on me. Feature Dave, blah, 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 da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out in front of the whole band. Spotlight on me, lights the whole thing. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so I turned around and they were like looking at me like, they thought I was pranking them, I think, because like I would do stuff, I would do stuff like that, but not that egregiously. Do They're it. gonna try and recreate the moment. It was amazing. So it's, yeah, the high uh, right, F, what, what, the side F, like the, the right hand top side key F. <laughs> That's what it sounded like. <laughs> and and I'm like, and I'm showman. I'm doing the whole thing. I'm like, I got the horn over my head. I'm like on my knee. And there was a back, a door on the side of the stage and I just left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was, it wasn't soul destroying. It was just super embarrassing. The furniture capital of the world is about a half hour south from my lift. So they have huge furniture manufacturing. So vendors from all over the world come down to this furniture market and they pay top dollar to have you play jazz because it's a show of wealth and prestige to their clients. And I remember playing jazz and I had to play softer and softer. And then I realized I don't need to be playing at all because like literally I might as well be a, a, a planted, planted shrub. Well, I'm just here for ambiance. And it was so depressing was soul crushing and you can see like people walk by with drinks and they look at you like, oh, don't look at the musicians. And I thought like, oh, it was, <laughs> that was soul crushing and realized like the uh, best paying gig I ever had, I'd honestly rather sell insurance. Yeah, I, f I feel your pain, man. I've, I've been there many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> We'd been asked to play a gig up on the Tablelands, like really, like this was, in, I lived in the sticks, this was further in the sticks, right? But there was like a nightclub opening or something, we had to go and play a set. The guitar player was a great guitar player and singer. But we found out on the day, we drove up, set the band up, and uh, we found out that afternoon that he was a recovering alcoholic. The gig start was supposed to start, no guitar player, and he was like the singer and the guitar player. Ended up like an hour later, well, we've got to play something. So we played something, made some music up, find out the next morning, he'd actually fallen right off a wagon, ended up in jail. And it was a complete disaster of a gig. It was quite a learning experience. Very embarrassing, very difficult, but uh, you know, <laughs> we've probably all been there, right? We've all had that sort of experience happen at some point.
I don't get ridiculous comments. I get only love, only support, and no one ever says anything stupid on my YouTube videos. Especially about the smooth jazz stuff. Especially about smooth. Everybody's super supportive of smooth jazz, and no one at all loves to talk crap about Kenny G on any of my videos. Because, or I hope he connects his saxophone to an AC outlet and then tries to play it. Because I would watch that video knowing that it would be the last video ever, <laughs> or something. I was like, I was like, at least he's original. At least he like thought about it. But I would, I would reassure both of us that we get the least trolly comments of any kind of YouTube genre. In fact, most of them are really True. very nice and very well informed. Almost all of them. Yeah. I don't get as many as I as you'd expect, I guess. And I read all the comments. Sometimes people don't really understand maybe something that I said that I maybe I thought was funny and people don't get the joke. You know, when you see the finished results of like YouTube videos and content, it looks so, it looks so easy. You're just, you know, turning the camera on and doing stuff and, and then uploading it. That's like the way other people make videos, you know, you point your phone at something, you press the button and then you upload it. But, right. you know, it's, we're not really just doing that. <laughs> No way. <laughs> you can say that again. Yeah, I get it's between YouTube and Instagram at least once or twice a month. I get people asking me to give them a saxophone. Oh, really? Like I have a like I have a spare one <laughs> laying around. I call up P. Marriott. Hey, this this guy from Instagram wants a saxophone. I've never I've never had that. I don't know about you. Before I got in, I thought I'm gonna need real thick skin. Um, and I'm gonna have to like have a therapist on call anytime I post. And by and large, with a couple of knuckleheads, we have the coolest community. And you and I share a lot of students. Mm. Um, and they're just, and, and what, I get a little nervous when I think about, like, we've got like retired engineers and scientists and doctors and lawyers. We've got these brilliant, successful people that are then watching us to learn to play saxophone. It's humbling. For some reason, we attract people that seem to make really positive comments. Jamie, that's because saxophone players are nice people. Yeah, every one of them, every one of them. If it was a gig, I would want to go see Cannonball Adderley play. I want to go back to, uh, I think it was 95 or 96, when Cal Ripken Jr. broke Lou Gehrig's record. And uh, it's a baseball thing here. It's a sport. I don't know if you know that but from over there. Uh, <laughs> it's a, uh, when he broke the record for 2,131 uh, <clears throat> consecutive games played. He was my favorite baseball player growing up, and I would have loved to have been there in person. Um, and then let's do a musical one. I would let's go back and see the recording of uh, a Love Supreme, oh. uh, Coltrane's classic quartet, to be in the studio and just like listening and being like, okay, you just recorded the greatest thing ever. Okay, cool, good. Let's go get some lunch. I don't want to give you too disappointing of an answer. My first um, instinct is to say I just I wouldn't go anywhere. I'm very happy where I am. Yeah, I don't know. It's just the way I am. So. I'd have to really think about it for, you know what? It's also because I'm indecisive. So if you if you gave me that question, I'd have to think about it for like a week before I made my decision. <laughs> so so I'm, that's why I'm giving you this very easy answer. Like, no, you know what? Get it. <laughs> I love guys like Ben Webster and Coleman Hawkins. And um, I just think it'd be awesome to go and to be in a club and actually see the guys that we listen to all the time live doing it but not like on a record just doing a gig playing maybe even going and seeing parker doing a live gig you know at birdland or vanguard or wherever he was playing this is weird it's not saxophone related there's this, this clip on youtube of uh bill evans playing with his trio in this like scandinavian like a swedish wealthy person's home this little trio concert and the music is so amazing and it's like the height, the, the just the perfection of jazz and music. I think it's like the pinnacle of Western art. It doesn't even have a saxophone, it's blasphemy, I know. But I would give almost anything to go sit in that room for that little private house concert. You know that you could see how the pyramids were built or, or see a dinosaur. I got to go see the dinosaurs. Or, um, <laughs> they, <laughs> or where yeah. Jesus Christ was born. You yeah. know, you could do these things too. But okay, I would, I see, would. You can go and see Bill Evans. That's cool. <laughs> I would. I would. I would smother baby Hitler on the way to Bill Evans' uh, uh, concert in the in the Swedish mansion. <laughs> yeah, I would. That's, that's, I, that's my, kill baby Hitler on the way to the Bill Evans concert. That's my final answer. <laughs> Standard. Yeah, such such an obvious, predictable answer. I know.
So I really hope you enjoyed this week's show. It's nice to get behind the scenes and actually ask the people that you know and love who always teach you saxophone every week something about themselves so that they get the chance to share a bit of information with you that you might not have known and you get the chance to get to know them a bit better. <laughs> now, if you haven't already checked out the amazing um, Caravan collaboration, please do use the card up there now. And if you want to learn a bit more about saxophone, and if you want to learn a bit more about saxophone, you can check out my Saxophone Success Masterclass as always. In the description, you will also find links for the YouTube videos that all the guys said that, that were their key video on YouTube. <laughs> and also you'll find links where you can find them on the internet. So until next week, practice hard, practice smart, and enjoy your music. See you later. <laughs> Can I make a t-shirt? Can we make t-shirts now? <laughs> Kill baby Hitler, go see Bill Evans. Taking the piss. <laughs> I like that. Because, well, we don't use that term, taking the piss, so...